Hi, I'm K.S. Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Nerdwork Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with the creator and illustrator of the upcoming graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale, Patrick Lugo. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Kayla. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for joining us. But uh, outside of my introduction, who is Patrick Lugo and what are you about? Oh, Patrick Lugo. I'm a New York-born artist who has spent half his life now in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, doing graphic design, illustration, and most recently, uh, I've returned to my roots as a comic artist. Okay, well, what is A Tiger's Tale about? Oh, A Tiger's Tale. How can I call it? It's it's what you can call a middle-grade wuxia fantasy. So wuxia is the Chinese term for kung fu fantasy. And so you can imagine A Tiger's Tale as something like Avatar The Last Airbender meets The Jungle Book. Mm-hmm. There's martial arts and there's talking animals. Okay, well, can you elaborate on your creative process for A Tiger's Tale? So just from a thought in your head, to now promoting it um, on the Kickstarter, when the Kickstarter comes out? Oh, well, Tiger's Tail has been with me for years. Um, I initially started it as a back page feature in the magazine, Kung Fu Magazine, uh, the magazine I worked for for more than two decades. It was the reason I moved from New York to California was to work for that magazine. And so they let me have a page, sometimes two or three pages in the back of the issue. And it ran in the magazine for a number of years. From that point, we, around the turn of the century, we started developing plans to make it into like a web animated series, but that kind of fell into a bit of a production limbo until let's say 2012. This is how long this project's been with me. So in 2012, I illustrated a children's book, which got me enough acclaim that it really re-inspired me to step further away from graphic design and back into comics. And so I've been spending about a decade now just developing what was once a one-page per issue comic strip into a full middle grade graphic novel. It's the story of uh, Khan. He's the prince of tigers who whose mother was a uh, queen of the jungle. She adopted a pair of humans, which as a result of Khan's jealousy, he ended up making mistakes, which sent him into exile. And now years later, if he's to find a home back in that jungle, that was once his kingdom, he has to re- reconcile with his brothers and uh, go on a quest as decreed by the court of dragons. Okay. Um. How can I how can I frame this? Did was there ever a struggle, or did you have to like kind of fight to tell this kind of story, depicting the you said Wusa fantasy, correct? Of you mm-hmm. know Asian mythology and deities and tales. Like, did it was there ever like a struggle of trying to find an audience for it, or um, having to, to to fight to tell this this story in a way? Because I'm thinking like, how did you find your audience? Well, it was. It was definitely, there's definitely been struggles embedded in the process. I mean, the audience was kind of there because, you know, I was writing the comic specifically for readers of a martial arts magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, there have been other comics published in martial arts magazines, but as Tiger's Tale really was the longest one, it lasted for a number of years. Uh, So there was an audience kind of built in, you know, I would get fan mail and, you know, we would, we would correspond, but that kind of tapered off you know, when the, when the project left publishing and tried to enter into the media sphere, you know, try and become animated, you know, animation is a huge production and we just weren't ready at the time. So then eventually I was able to regain that property. And so that was a whole number of years where it was just stuck in limbo and I couldn't do anything with it. So I would say that was a major, you know, hurdle to get past. Mm -hmm. And then once I had it back, I had to kind of rearrange my workflow and my space so that I could, you know, devote time and energy to this project while having a full time job and while doing other freelance projects, you know, album cover art, T-shirt art, that sort of thing. But right around 2019, I finally finished it. It was a 
It was going to be this black and white 138 page graphic novel it was going to have a glossary in the back so that it would reflect um, the stuff that I had learned. Right. Tiger's Tale was all about me learning from the various Kung Fu masters that I worked with at the magazine and then translating what they would tell me their folklore and translating it into a format that was more um, digestible for younger readers who might not be as familiar with the uh, you know, the, the language or the, the, the details, the history behind, you know, martial art customs. Okay. Um, let's, let's go a little bit back to the creative process from the pages that you sent me. Mm -hmm. I liked how, um, it was formatted. The out, the art style, how it was formatted, how the panels were formatted. It's kind of like, it's graphic. Like it is, black and white and then like maybe in the middle of the page or to emphasize something on the page it's kind of like on a gray scale which i really like so it's not these like harsh breaks or anything like like anything like that on the page you're still getting the information you're still getting the story but it's not it it fills up the page but it doesn't crowd the page if that makes sense so is that how you've always worked or is it something that's developed over time or did a tiger's tail look like that before? And again, when you reworked it, when you got it back in your hands again, is it something that kind of evolved from what it was previously? It definitely evolved. In fact, a tiger's tail was always like a, a format for me to experiment with what I was learning. So when I initially started the strip, it was pretty basic black and white pen and ink drawings. Um, as my skills evolved as by exposure through um, traditional martial artists, I started uh, adopting some of the traditional Chinese uh, brush painting techniques and trying to incorporate what was this ancient style of art into a more modern context. And I um, mean, that just coincided with my love of, you know, traditional media, watercolor, pen and ink. But I was also, you know, a graphic designer. And so my job as a magazine layout artist included tons of photo retouching and mm -hmm. magazine layout. So I would take those black and white images, scan them in, and then begin photo retouching it and using Photoshop and retouching software, you know, more and more like another uh, palette or another art tool for art. Mm -hmm. um, and so that option allowed me to layer in layers of traditional artwork with digital filters and digitally created artwork. And that would also tie into my tendency for magazine layout, you know, as a, the interesting thing with my job as a magazine layout artist was that martial arts magazines, you know, include lots of step-by-step -step instructions. So I was still able to use uh, like sequential art practices, but rather than drawing, you know, superheroes or comic characters, I was using photographs of actual martial artists. I'm sure you could imagine, you know, step one, the attacker punches, step two, the defender blocks and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh -huh. So that kind of uh, method of, of laying out an article kind of translated onto laying out a graphic novel where now instead of having columns of texts i just had as many panels as i needed to to lay out a given page and then the artwork was was created separately it was stored in a single database and then i could grab pieces as i needed them you know sometimes you know it would be a double page spread as i moved along in the story i might decide that i need to rechange the pacing so i could take that same image and shrink it down to a single page spread you know, or I could use it as a background for a subsequent scene. You know, it gave me a lot of flexibility to really, you know, shift and evolve a tiger's tail. Even to this day, you know, like with the Kickstarter eminent and the project 99% complete, there are still little bits of artwork that I'm kind of waiting to work on and little things that I want to do just at the moment that it needs to happen. I want to keep that like improvisational energy embedded within the comic. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel the same way sometimes about my work with um with like some of my writing. 
Like I have the idea and I've already written out the scene, but I don't know what to do with it. But I know I know where I can fit it in at, but I kind of have to see where it goes first before I can actually do it. So you kind of just kind of just winging it as of right now. But then you're winging it right now. But when you put it in there, it's, it looks like you actually knew what you were doing the whole time, which I think is great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I've, I've described my method to some other, you know, comic artists and some of their jaws just drop. They just can't believe that I, you know, that I'm so detached from the finished page that I can go back and shift panels around, you know, add a panel here. Oh, I need a close up or, you know, spread panels around. It's fun once you kind of develop the technique, but it's definitely not like a, a, a conventional method. And it's, it can be time consuming. So I wouldn't recommend it, you know, for when one has a deadline. This was really about, you know, this passion project that's been with me for so long. Well, on this project, how was it collaborating with um, martial artists to kind of tell their tale, tell the folklore in this project? Like, you know, you've, you've worked in a martial arts magazine for some time, but was there any difference in a way? Like this wasn't work. This was something that you were passionate about and you kind of wanted to get it right. So how was it collaborating with them on this project versus with, with work, if that makes sense? Well, it was definitely a lot more fun. I mean, I've been a, a great fan of mythology and folklore since, since I learned how to read, really. Um, so the chance to, you know, I had to get to know these martial arts masters because as um, art director, it was my job to kind of, how would you say it? I would have to bring out their essence so that the photographer can capture it and then we could put it on a magazine cover, right? So I, I'd always have to, I'd have to learn a little bit about the style. And I was lucky because I, you know, I was going to be laying out the article. So I'd be reading about them or I would sit in on the interview that we would be having. And then once we were, we were in the photo studio, I could just work with them and kind of try and see what their relationship is to their martial arts. And the great thing is, you know, martial artists, especially those who are teachers, want to teach. And so they were very eager to share, you know, the insights behind their martial arts. And the thing that separated me from others is that many want to have, um, they want to know, like, what's practical for the streets? You know, they want to know how to use this as a self-defense thing. Whereas I was more interested in the philosophy behind it and the whole, um, how it fits in with the cosmology of, of martial arts or the cosmology of how China sees the world. You know, it's, it's so deep and it's such an ancient society that there's just, you know, it's kind of like a bottomless well in terms of what there is to learn. And so Tiger's Tale was this fun way to really ask them fun questions. And I would sit there with my sketch pad. I would maybe do a caricature of them, which would kind of break the ice. You know, I tear it out of my sketch pad, give it to them. You know, they'd be amused. I knew enough to like draw a few Chinese characters here and there. And they really liked that. So it would break the ice. And in some cases, you know, we would develop a relationship where these martial artists would come back to the magazine or they would teach seminars at the magazine, which I could attend. And so in some cases, some of these martial artists are renowned artists in their own right. So we could connect on that level as well. Yeah. It, I, I guess the rapport you built with them helped a lot with, you know, obtaining knowledge from them. So you can write your story. Cause I kept thinking, it was like, was it intimidating to talk with these martial artists, you know, these respected artists uh, and teachers? But it, it uh, from what I'm hearing, you, you know, were able to break the ice and, um, and and get the information that you needed respectfully. I was like, how, like, how can I respectfully obtain information like this from people? That it seems so um, intimidating, but it seems like you you've done a, a great job of building a rapport with them. I was lucky, you know, because I also had, you know, I had others to to help bridge the gap, especially when there were language barriers, you know, mm -hmm. not all of these masters could speak English. And sometimes, you know, their English was not that strong. But 
because we were there in a professional ca capacity, there were translators if necessary who could bridge the gap. So I could just casually ask some other questions that weren't necessarily related to the article, but you know, might result in an interesting photograph. And eventually that would also you know, lead to why is that posture called tiger style? And then they would start talking about why tigers are important. You know, why in China, the tiger is the king of the jungle and not the lion, you know, things like that, which for them, you know, were stories they grew up with. But, you know, for me, it was it was new. Or, you know, sometimes I knew I knew some aspects, but there was just so many layers and there are still so many layers. You know, even to this day, I'm learning new things and some of these masters are making suggestions that are making me feel like, oh, yes, it's really important to add that sequence into the comic so that there's some some legitimate wisdom to be offered. Yeah. All right. So was there. Just how can I ask this? Was there any, I guess, pressure to to get it right? Because I mean, you you have you you have access to these uh, to these masters, and you're building a rapport with them, and they're eager to share the information with you. But even when you were sketching and, and drawing out the scenes and whatnot, did you ever feel like, oh man, I like I have to get I have to get this right? Was there a lot of pressure with that, or was it very more of like a relaxed and casual thing? Like, you know, even if I, I guess not even if that maybe you have enough information, like you felt like you had enough information you know, from the masters and from the years of working for a martial arts magazine that, you know, that you, that you've got, not that you've got it right, but it, it, it makes sense on the page. I may not be making sense, but well, it, it kind worked, of well, made sense on the page. I think the, the big, my biggest priority was that I wanted it, I wanted to have fun doing it. Mm. You know, it was it was already fun to learn these things. And so I definitely wanted to um, convey my understanding of what I was learning. But I've also been corrected. And there have been times when, you know, they've sent me a letter or a postcard and say and said, actually, this is this is more accurate. You should have said this. So. There are times when, you know, I've I've had to adjust and had to look at the story and say, you know what? Yeah, that, that was a, that was too flimsy of an idea. Let me, let me explore something a little more, you know, deeper or a little more valuable, or let me try and do something to make the story more substantial so that it's not just this cliche about this idea, but it, it also coincides with stories that, you know, where the characters have motivation and the characters seem a little more real, even though, the characters are also based on, how would you say it? Like philosophical principles mm -hmm. as well. So like, you know, the name of a given, of a given character, Khan, for instance, you know, that name in Chinese has a bunch of different meanings. You know, one of them also has to do with being the third brother. And one of them has to do with, um, how would I say it? Like a, a dark and murky lake where there are things below the surface, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, naming the character that way gave me the chance to remember that these are the things that make that character who they are. You know, another character from the comic is Chen. Chen is one of the human brothers raised by the jungle. And Chen also means thunder, you know? And so it also, it's, you know, part of his character is that he's a, uh, he's a bit of a hothead, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's the one that's a little more willing to, to, to start a fight like a, like some martial artists might be. And so I wanted the name, you know, for those who know, they'll see that name and they'll say, oh, that's a, you know, that's a trigram from, a, from the I Ching, you know, a, a piece of Chinese philosophy, you know. But if you're reading the comic, it might just be the name of the character and that should be enough. All right. Um, what advice would you offer to other artists you wish someone would have told you when you first started? Hmm. Um, don't lose sight of what you what you really want. Don't get too distracted. I know that I've like Tiger's Tale, you know, could have come out 
years earlier, but you know, I, I pursued other interests and I, I don't necessarily regret some of those other interests. They opened other doors, but you know, there are, there was a chunk of time when I was considered myself more of a graphic designer than a comic artist. And now here I am really embracing my passion for comics and thinking, you know what? I didn't have to be so much of a graphic artist, you know, X number of years ago, I could have really, you know, kept going to conventions and kept trying to like, get that thing, you know, get that thing published. But life has twists and turns. So I think there's also, uh, it's also important to kind of not be too hard on yourself, you know, and to try and really, uh, especially in days like today, right? Like try and really capture and just acknowledge those little victories, you know, and really remind yourself that, okay, things may be tough at this level, but, you know, there are still victories that you can find. And, you know, those victories can help you get over that initial hurdle. Well, while you were working as a graphic designer for most of the time before you went back into comics, I mean, was it something that just kind of that you preferred to do at the time or maybe something that was just working out better for your life at the time than comics were? Maybe because a lot of that is, you know, or maybe you just maybe have lost interest or this became more interesting of a project to do. Or maybe it was like, oh, you know, I have the skills and the knowledge of a graphic designer. I'll just pursue more graphic design stuff. So was that maybe something that was happening then? You know, are you willing to share? It was definitely, it was a few factors, many of which you mentioned. Um, definitely there was a financial component. It was kind of easier to make a living as a graphic, as a graphic artist, particularly as an in-house graphic artist, where I just knew I had to fulfill these things. And then at the same time, I was fortunate in that that company really recognized enough of my interests that they would uh, let me pursue new endeavors, you know. I pitched the concept of Kung Fu Magazine uh, doing T-shirts and, and, the, and they said yes. And so for a number of years, I was just cranking out artwork for T-shirts that they would then sell as part of their online store. And so there are, there are hundreds of T-shirts out there with my artwork, some of which I'm really fond of, some of which I'm not so fond of. Um, so there were things like that. And at the same time, there was... Um, opportunities to get more into uh, like media type activities as the company grew they started investing in more um event production right like we weren't just publishing a magazine we were hosting martial arts tournaments and so then i and that's a lot of work but then i can go in there and you know rather than trying to draw caricatures i could run around with a camcorder and record video and you know, interview martial artists and interview competitors. And, you know, so then there were these other projects like that, right? So there was always the opportunity to learn a little bit. And so long as I was able to learn and make a living, you know, that was fun. And then still nights and weekends, I would draw and do illustrations. But once again, it would be, it would be easier and it would pay more to do a single illustration for say a record album cover Mm -hmm. than it would to do to try and do a 10 page comic pitch and you know go to San Diego Comic Con and try and you know get a gig that way you know of course the comic industry has changed so much so there's there's been a lot of ebb and flow over the course of that time mm -hmm. all right well let's go ahead and segue into my last question um which kind of piggybacks off of this, which is, uh, what is your idea of success? So I ask everyone this, you know, if you're not making regular paychecks from a full-time job or uh, making consistent revenue from your art, we're considered failures, right? So mm -hmm. many of us will put our dreams and projects on the back burner and give them up altogether because this career can be highly intimidating and competitive. So what is your idea of quote unquote success, Patrick? Oh yeah. I mean, first of all, I should say that my idea of success is very fluid and I've just, you know, I can look back and see how that concept has changed radically over the years. Mm -hmm. And so I think number one, it's important to kind of, for me to recognize that 
my definition of success has changed in the past and it could easily change in the future. So I shouldn't get um, too attached to any like one definition. Um, I've seen, you know, peers and, and others who, who can suffer as a result of that specific attachment, you know, beyond that, I think um, a certain level of freedom or a certain level of um, confidence in one's ability to express, make use of the freedom they have, you know, so I have a website and it's mine. So I get to do whatever I want on it. You know, it may not get, may not get tons of likes. It may not get tons of videos, videos, but that uh, videos, why did I say that? I meant uh, views. That's the word I meant. Anyway, so the website is still mine, so I can still tweak it and play with it and just know that no matter what's out there, I also have a website, you know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's a kind of a low bar, but it's, 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 uh, it's kind of nice to send an email that's not necessarily like a Yahoo account or Gmail account, you know, that's Mm -hmm. like, this email is me, this website is, is mine. So that's, that's a little bit of success, you know, and then added to that, I find that, um, if I keep that kind of attitude, then success comes to me in, in very unexpected ways. Um, you know, I submitted a short comic to an anthology that was being produced by some friends of mine. Uh, this was around 2018, let's say. Um, it was short. I, you know, he gave me the he gave me the pitch. It sounded fun. I submitted the comic, and then the the anthology kind of went dormant. It took a couple of years for it to actually surface. And then in 2020, the, con- the anthology got a publishing deal through a university press. Mm-hmm. There was also a Kickstarter for it so that the contributors can get paid. You know, both of those were successes. You know, I could feel like they were a bit my success as well, but then the success really came when the anthology was re- released, right? Just this September, it's called Speculative Fiction for Dreamers. And it got a star review by Publishers Weekly. It, uh, I even got called out, you know, by name. They mentioned the comic that I contributed and they just said my name. And so that's a bit of success that I was, I was not expecting, but it's out there, you know. Hey, Publishers Weekly liked one of my comics, you know. That counts. So, I mean... I hope those answered your question, but I, I, if, if I keep trying to answer it, I think I'll start going in a bunch of different directions, you know, success yeah. is having a beautiful dog. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it definitely um, answers my question. Um, when you said about having a certain amount of freedom, um, I've never heard that from anyone. It's normally if, if you can make money it's success, but the, you said that you look at it as being fluid and that, I guess that it evolves your, your definition of success evolves, I guess, as you continue to pursue, whether it be comics or whether it be graphic design or whatever it may be that you're interested in. I feel like the more you're interested in it, um, the more open you become to accepting knowledge and opportunity and that uh, success follows things like that, especially when you, when you work at it, again, when you're interested in it. So, so yeah, because my definition of success is kind of similar in a way now, because I mean, before it's, it's money, it's always money. If you can make money off of it and love what you do, that's pretty much the ultimate success. But having freedom to pursue what it is that you want to pursue and for however long that you want to, and then evolving. So how my work looked like six months ago, a year ago, is not the same as it was, as it is now, I should say. I've definitely grown and, you know, put myself out there, which I would have never done a year ago. Um, It's just growth, I think, would be my definition of success and evolving, like, as you, as you, as you've just said. Oh, yeah. I mean, that sounds great. I mean, I think, you know, the the things that you are doing, I mean, I think this podcast is a success, you know, like the the fact that you're you're putting yourself out there and you're, you know, you're, you're striving to express, you know, who you are and what you're about. I mean, just the fact that you'll answer that sort ask that sort of thing at the beginning of your episode, right, that that shows your values, you know, their, their success in being able to communicate values, you know, 
um, which I think is important. I mean, I think also, um, you know, it might be a strange thing to say, but, you know, we live in a capitalist society. That's no surprise. Yeah. But, you know, capitalism is kind of a form of tyranny, right? Like, wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to really work so hard to, to have the things that we all need, you know, like, yeah, so within yeah. the context of needing to make money, right? Like the chance to make a little bit of money doing something you like, you know, should be mm -hmm. fun, should should help. And once again, that's why it's important to like really put a spotlight on those little victories, right? Because those things can add up. You can, you know, you can build the pyramids with bricks, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I remember hearing from someone, she said that, um, she, I guess we shouldn't have to work so hard. We, we shouldn't have to go so hard to just be able to experience something, you know, or having, having access to something. We shouldn't have to drive miles away from our homes to have fresh food because we live in the food desert, you know, mm -hmm. or we have to take multiple buses and trains to get to work just so we can come back home and pay the rent and not have anything else to do, stuff like that. So, yeah, I... I I definitely agree with what you just said. I mean, with that said, I mean, it's also important to have, to uh, recognize, you know, the wealth that we all benefit from just by virtue of the society we live in. Mm -hmm. um, many years ago, when I was much younger, I, I did some volunteer work and, you know, traveled to Africa and, and spent, spent a summer, you know, traveling and, and you know, digging wells, build, building fences and just really getting a, a front row seat on what, you know, what it's like to live, you know, live in a town where there is only one well that everyone mm -hmm. drinks out of, you know, things like that. And, you know, to come back after that, you know, even the fact that there are public bathrooms to be found, you know, is a form of wealth. So yeah. it's kind of a balancing act, you know, like the capacity to like really under, you know, express appreciation and try and really recognize that, you know, we live in a first world society where, where things are not too bad for people, mm -hmm. although things can be terrible for others, you know, like it's, it's, yeah. it's a really crazy dichotomy. I don't know what I was trying to say with that. I mean, I think it's, I think it's just important to kind of acknowledge, you know, like that weird balance. Oh yes. I was thinking of a, of an old Chinese saying that, that a lot of martial artists tell me and it translates to you have to eat bitter before you can eat sweet uh -huh. and um you know so within the context of martial arts right you have to do the hard work before you can do the cool stunts mm -hmm. kind of what it sums up but you know i mean i think it translates everywhere right you've got to you've got to do some hard work before you can you know benefit the reward from the rewards of those efforts you know yeah exactly but, uh, is there anything else that you want to touch on about a tiger's tail that I may have missed? Uh, do you know any rewards for potential backers for your Kickstarter yet? Or is there anything oh. else that you wanted to discuss? Maybe your uh, the muse letter? Well, yeah, I have a I have a monthly muse letter, which has been fun. It's it's um it includes a, a kind of a stream of consciousness comic that I that I do, although I'll be putting that on pause for the sake of the Kickstarter campaign. Mm. Um, it's been key to, to, you know, to get through these past couple of years, um, reaching out and kind of keeping connected with, with supporters and with artists and other, you know, and other fans, you know, it's, it's something that you can do through social media and that's, that can be great fun too, but there's something kind of unique about, you know, having like a collection of people that that will, you know, reply back to me when I send my latest, you know, my latest, my latest newsletter out or my latest little web comic, you know, uh, the last one I did was for Christmas. And it was like a little story about me as a kid and like, like, um, you know, how I earned a lump of coal one year, you know, a fun little fun little thing like that. But um, as far as Tiger's Tale, I have a uh quite a few rewards, you know, I'll, I'll be doing a few sketch variants for the cover. I'm really excited about one of the martial artists who's agreed to do a traditionally Chinese painted cover oh. as an alternate. So that'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have um, 
a short mini comic that um that I'll be including. I did this around 2020. It's kind of like kung fu versus vampires. So that's Ooh. kind of fun. I've also got some some copies of this. This this was part of an art gallery show that I did for a Tiger's Tale a number of years ago. And so I printed out like a short little, you know, pretty high quality paper. It was a short little comic. But the thing was that since Tiger's Tale evolves, the story here is completely different than the rest of the graphic novel. So uh, backers can get the graphic novel and then they can also get this version and they can see like different ways the story um, evolved. You know, and then the other thing that I'll be really excited to do is um, include some gallery prints and some original art with rewards, right? So I've got pieces like this, Ooh. which was featured in one of my gallery shows. Let's see if I can give you a better. I've got a lot of glare going on. There we go. Yeah, that's good. So this was part of one of my gallery shows. Um, you could even see in the back, it's still got the tag from the gallery. So that'll be like a reward tier. Um, I've got a bunch of stickers. I've got, um, as, as I might've mentioned, right? The campaign is gonna start February 1st, uh, Chinese New Year. So I've got this cool little sticker of a luck dragon. You might remember luck dragons from say the never ending story. Uh -huh. So I've got my own here in gold, which will be another you know, another little add on. So, I mean, since I've been working in publishing for years, I love creating a bunch of random things like that. So if, uh, if things go well, I've got um, some hopes for maybe doing a patch that you can iron on. That could be fun. Uh -huh. And, um, and then I think there's going to be uh, something that I I'm still haven't really um, set in stone, but I think I'm going to ask, for feedback from Kickstarter supporters to help me develop what, what the final cover should be, right? I'll mm -hmm. have variant covers and I'll even have like a blank cover. I had it here in my pile of items. Oh, here it is. So this is what like a sketch cover will look like. And then I could just, you know, brush and pen and, and draw my own tiger or something on it. Uh -huh. But then I've got some, you can even see them back there on the wall. Those are some preliminary designs of the cover. And so what I'm hoping to do is get feedback from backers to help me really get a cover that everyone's going to like. And I think that's going to be kind of a fun and interesting thing where, you know, people can sign up on my Discord server and they can actually watch me as I, as I finish doing the art for some pieces. Oh yeah, that that definitely sounds really interesting. So yeah, I, I look forward to seeing what the Kickstarter looks like and how everyone responds to it. Because like, like I said, I was you know reading what you gave me and looking at it, and it's just so interesting to me and the whole layout and art style. And I just I, I love it and how you were explaining what 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 inspired you. It makes sense as well because I was like, I, I love people's art style, but I can never name it. I have no idea what it is, but then you said what it was, thankfully. So I wouldn't say I'm foolish. All well, right. I might change the name, you know, I mean, it's fluid. So even the name of that art style might change. But also, I also should mention that I'm going to be coloring the book too, right? Like I yeah. initially had the vision that it should be a black and white comic, right? It's, it's a comic that starts with yin and yang, black and mm -hmm. white, right? So it always made sense. It's a yin and yang comic. It should be black and white. But, um printing technology makes it so easy now. And really, if I want to reach out to young readers, you know, young readers really want to see colorful stuff. And, and I can do color pretty well. So, so yeah, so that's going to be a whole other new aspect to the project is like brand new colors that, that I'm kind of excited about because it's got another, how would you say, it's got another layer of how it's going to incorporate itself into the story. Uh-huh. So yeah, I mean, either way, I mean, from what I've seen that you've sent me, it it looks amazing. So color will definitely en enhance it, but I feel like even this alone works really well. So I learned 
when I studied graphic design, he told me, my professor told me, if it doesn't work in black and white, it's not going to work in color. So it definitely works either way, Patrick. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you saying so, because, you know, as being uh, a, an artist shut in, you know, ch chained to their art table, you can say it's uh -huh. not always easy to get feedback. I mean, I have critique groups, so I get feedback that way. But then to, you know, get feedback from someone such as yourself really, you know, really means a lot because it's kind of letting me know that that I'm kind of on the right track, you know, mm -hmm. that there are people who might enjoy what, I, what I'm trying to offer and what I'm trying to communicate. And, you know, I mean, art needs dialogue or mm -hmm. else it's not really art, so. Yeah. All right, well, again, I want to thank the creator and illustrator of the upcoming graphic novel, A Tiger's Tale, Patrick Lugo. I highly recommend our listeners to give Patrick's website a look, share, and back the Kickstarter if they can when it goes live. All of Patrick's socials and website will be listed in this episode's details, as well as the Kickstarter link at a later date. Again, I'm K.S. Garner, and you've been listening to a solo Nerdbird podcast. Thank you. <laughs>